as you may have noticed, uh, I am quite busy making YouTube videos. Um, I'm on vacation and I have so many topics that I want to go through and I am constantly being distracted by new ones. So um, that's the thing. Right now it's early morning and I am waiting for everyone else to wake up. So might as well make it a video. Um, so this is a video about a thing that's really close to my heart, my own heart. Um, this is a sort of a continuation of Bolt makes a list for a certain army. And this one is a British one and it's Desert Brits. Um, so how would I make an eighth army list if I was beginning out again? That's sort of my, my uh, stand. And the one thing that I can say with absolute certainty, because I own a large uh, British army, is that I would start buying two boxes of Perry uh, Desert Brits, Desert Rats. Um, that kit is absolutely amazing. The miniatures are more well proportioned than Warlord Games ones. They are sculpted very, very well. They are very realistic in their size. I love them to bits. I am a Perry fanboy, as you may notice. I really like their sculpts. Um, and I also really like that they are plastics, um, which means that it's very, very easy to convert. Um, so from, from my, I think I have over time bought four boxes of those. Um, I have made Gurkhas from that, I have made regular infantry from that, I have made forward of service, I've made artillery crews, I've made crews for my vehicles, all of that from just one box. There are so many bits that you can sort of snip away and put on something else. It really works brilliantly. So if you're not much of a converter, going plastic is just so much more easy. Um, the one thing that that's sort of lacking in that set is that it, the the bases are not Warlord Games official bases. They're a bit smaller, so you need uh, you may need to find new bases. Washers at the local hardware store might do. So um, so yeah, that's how I would do that. Um, so buying lots of that, and then there are of course really really beautiful kits of vehicles from Rubicon especially and Warlord games as well uh, that I would look at um, and, and buy. But I'll tell you more about that in a second. Right. You know the drill. I'm going to Easy Army. Um, so let me just share my screen with you guys and let's go. Here we go. So we're building a new list. Close the commercial and we're building a British one. Now, again, if I wanted to start out building a British army, there are loads and loads of very nice theatre platoons, and many of them are uh, African ones. So the British Armoured Brigade, the Commonwealth Infantry. But since that is not allowed in most uh, of our tournaments, in Denmark at least, and in the UK, I know that, that theatre platoons are not allowed. And maybe especially Western Desert, because they do have some theater platoons that are slightly overpowered. Um, so let's let's try and, and build just a regular one, um, just generic reinforced platoon. Uh, so we go down until we find the British reinforced platoon. There we go. That is what we need. We can still tailor this to to be very thematic for the desert. Um, so this is what we got. We got a lot of special rules over here, and I'm going to show you how to use those to your advantage. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you what I think a beginner should go for um, with, with Brits. Um, as per usual, we need to fill out the um, the slots over here, the, the obligatory ones. Um, and there's a lot more choices. You'll see this, right? There's a lot more choices here. Most of it is something that is not normally allowed in a generic reinforced platoon. Um, so for me, just going for a regular, in this case, an inexperienced second lieutenant, uh, that's the way to go. So 
I always choose the inexperienced second lieutenant. Two reasons. One, I'm not very good at using the snap to rule efficiently. I, I do have players in Denmark who are good at that, but I am not one of them. So for me, my lieutenant often becomes just a morale bonus to the guys around him. As such, there's no need to buy him at 50 points. Uh, those extra points do not make him that much more valuable and that much more efficient and survivable. So I am just buying an inexperienced dude. If I have the points left over later, we'll go back and buy an extra man for him right now. Let's just save the points for something more important because he's not important. I always equip my lieutenant, by the way, with an SMG and uh, <laughs> for my army, I, I built my army to represent sort of yeah, the, the average Commonwealth soldier somehow. So all my infantrymen are, are slightly dark skinned and my officers are very light skinned. So um, the officers are British officers and the men are from one of the Commonwealth nations. They could be Indians, uh, basically. So. So an, um, a very light skinned, maybe even red tanned because the desert rats were famous for being red kneed, right? Because they had gotten too much sun um, officer with an SMG. That's the way to go. Um, we also need some infantry. Now, there are several ways you can go when you're building desert themed armies. You can go you can go the long range desert group. Um, which is one way, right? And you can get infantry that are sort of like that. You get SAS and make them like early war uh, like that. That can work. You can also go and buy Maori, early war Maori infantry, because famously the, um, the Maori battalions of the New Zealand army fought in the desert, and that is where they sort of made their reputation. Maori infantry. Uh, in the game is really, really strong. Um, it is not, um, it is competitive, but it is slightly overshadowed by the Gurkhas if you're just going for competitive uh, play. They're really good in close combat, um, the Maoris, and they have a lot of special rules. I don't think this is the way to go for a newer player simply because um, they're really difficult to use. All close combat troops are surprisingly difficult to use. You need to move them up into that close combat. It's not just an auto win button where you sort of push and then then uh, they magically kill everything in sight. Um, that's not how it works. So for me, uh, I think an early war infantry section uh, is the way to go if you're going theme. Um, and they're also they're also very useful these infantry sections. Um, you'll notice that they're regulars, and as such, I think we need eight to ten men in the units. Um, you can also do something that's really really cool. You can mount them on cavalry, uh, on camels, so they become cavalry. Um, uh, I want to do this, I want to try this because cavalry is really, really good, but um, it's really difficult to cut, get the model for, models for this. So um, we're not going that way. We're going regular infantry, eight man units with rifles, all of them. There's no reason to buy any upgrades, especially not the light machine gun. The British friend is definitely not good enough for that. So that is what we're doing and we're going two of those and we'll maybe do some something a little bit different with the rest of our infantry, but that will make a decent base of infantry. Right, so what else do we need? Um, well, one of the things that we can look at is tanks. Um, the, the British uh, famously uh, quite early in the war got some very nice tanks from the US. So, and just sticking with theme here, one of the tanks that did arrive in the desert was the Stewards. Um, now the Stewards have a bad rep, rightly so, for being overly competitive. And let me show you how to build that. So you take an early war steward, that's the M31. 
um, that's the earliest war, Stuart. It's it's pretty bad. It's it's um, it's a light tank. It's eight plus. It's it's got vulnerable, which means that it's even less armored in sides. So basically, any anti tank weapon will kill this if you get hit. Um, it has a turret mounted light anti tank gun, coaxial MMG, and a whole forward facing MMG. So that seems pretty reasonable, all of it, right? Now, the thing that you can do with a steward is that you can make it into an absolute pillbox by adding two forward hole mounted LMGs. These used to be MMGs, overpowered as far. Um, but now they're LMGs, meaning that you can just by adding this one for 15 points that's eight shots for 15 points um you can make your steward into an absolute monster of a unit killer this will erase enemy infantry um hands down it's just that good now um we can do even more theme here making it a steward recce what happens then is they remove the turret and the anti-tank gun and mount an HMG instead. So for me, that is slightly more friendly if you do that. Um, and it will fit the theme of a British army scouting ahead of a main force. Uh, but I don't want that for this army. I want this army, uh, that I'm this list that I'm building here, to be the main force actually trying to hit the enemy uh, lines. So I am making a darker steward because that is really good. That's a really valuable uh, tool that I think that beginners also need to learn about. I, I'm not mounting the pintle mounted MMG on the turret. Um, and this is because, yes, it's really, really cheap. And that would mean that I could sp split my fire three ways, one way where the pin mounted shoots, one where the coaxial shoot, and one where, where the hole shoots. But it does mean that if I shoot the pin mount, I become open turret until the end of the turn. So for a beginner, that is a pro play, and I would not recommend it. Um, that means that you have to do certain things with your, your tank. I think you should just go with this. It's still very, very good. So, now all British armies get the Observer for free. So let's get one of those. Free Artillery Observer. And he doesn't need anything either. Um, that's an Artillery Observer. It's really, really good. Um, you don't need to do anything about that. It's really, really good as it is. The British also have some of the best armored car choices of the game. Um, and there are several of them that are really, really good for the desert. So you can go with the Daimler armored car. It's very bad. You can do the Humber armored car. That is not actually that bad. Um, at uh, 95 points for a regular one, it gets a light autocannon and a coaxial MMG, and it's a 7 plus armored car. Uh, very thematic for the desert. They had quite a lot of the, these in the early war. They were like a go-to armored car early to mid war. Um, I'm not a particular fan of it myself, but it is very good um, for those points. What I think you should do is you should buy an AEC armored car. Let's just show you that one. Uh, it can be equipped with a light anti-tank gun and a coaxial MMG. That is not the best configuration. You'll notice that it's 135 points for a light tank, uh, but it's it's got way less machine guns than your average steward. There's one of them. Let's go. Oh, AEC, AEC Mark III. Then you get a medium anti-tank gun, um, but it, it all does become expensive. So the AEC is a possibility. The one that I really like like um, is the is it the stack hound the stack hound was a, another a delivery from the us it was actually it, it failed to become the american armored car which i think any bold action player <laughs> should be very sad about for the americans 
um, but it became uh, one of the British armored cars, and it is an absolute beast of an armored car. It's the best armored car of the game. 145 points uh, for a regular one. You can buy a pinnacle mounted MMG for it. You can uh, <coughs> remove the bow MMG, the, the uh, hull mounted bow MMG, um, and exchange the anti tank gun with a light howitzer. Um, you can remove the bow MMG and uh, replace the light anti tank gun with a medium anti tank gun as well. So you become a, a Staghound Mark III. There are all sorts of weird and wacky and beautiful options that you get with this. It's an 8 plus. It's a tank. Um, it has the hole mounted and the coaxial and a forward facing hole mounted for 145 points. So for 10 points more than the AEC, we get a hole mounted MMG. This is a beautiful car. I love it to bits. We are doing the stack hound. <clears throat> So right now you're doing one of the things that you can with desert bits is you can have two tanks, these two tanks, and both of them are really good. Um, the stack count especially so because you can you can split fire with that as well. So with these two tanks you can actually you can you can shoot at four units um, because you can split the fire of the machine guns, or you can c concentrate your fire, making sure that some units get a lot of uh, pins. So that is really good. Another thing you could do here is you could go and buy a long range desert group uh, truck or a long range desert group Jeep um, to be thematic for um, if you wanted that pushed into the desert that uh, then you're buying SAS infantry, a long range desert style infantry, right? Um, that is not the thing that I want to do right now. I, right now, I want to make sure that I have infantry and tanks for a mainline push. So that is what we're going for. Now, if I'm running a mainline push, I want the observer to represent the artillery coming in from a long way away, and I also want more artillery. So we're buying the 25 pounder here. Uh, regular howitzer. Boom, there we go. It has a 25 pounder AT shell, which is really good, which means that it can shoot a four plus AT gun. Um, that is brilliant. And I will even add a spotter for this one because we may want to have it so that we can see all of the table and, and shoot it directly. For 55 points, 65 with a spotter, brilliant really worth the points. The British 25 pounder is one of the best lighthouses of the game. So that that we want. We also want something competitive. So we're going medium mortar. And for that, let's go another regular with a spotter just because we can. We can see the whole table then and shoot at everything we want to. Right. This was a good base. Um, I think we need some more infantry and I think we need something that can push. So let's go for the Maoris that I talked about. So Maoris here, they're regular infantry and we need to make this a unit that can really push up and attack something. Um, and that would be late game. Now, the Maoris have the formidable fighter special rule, which means that they have blood curling charge, so the enemy can't shoot at them when you charge them, except if they're on ambush, but there's no like defensive fire. Up and at them, which means that they can uh, sort of do a bonsai charge. They can charge. If you're, if you're um, just running them towards the enemy, then you can do that without actually taking a test and toughest boots, meaning that they get plus one dice per three men in close combat. So they're geared towards close com combat, these units. So let's make them 10 man regular, right? That is a good unit. That's a good close combat unit, but you're going to need to save their strength because they are regulars. So you're going to need to save their strength or late 
uh, in the game. We're still going with the theme of early war here. If I was making them even better, I would make them veterans, uh, mid to late war veterans. Let's see, they are down here. Yeah, they're mid to late war Maori veterans. Um, but we're doing slightly thematic here, right? And we need more regular infantry. Again, eight man unit. Ding. And you need to fill out all the infantry slots. That is my first go to. I need to do this. Um, because you, you'll have games where you're, um, you're fighting for objectives, so you need that infantry to be able to move up and, and get those objectives. So, this was a good start. Um, I think we should also take a flamethrower team. Um, it's just such a useful tool to have, um, but it's a small team, it's vulnerable to snipers, so I think we need some transport for it. So, for the Brent, uh, Sorry, for the flamethrower, we need a Jeep. The inexperienced Jeep. Again, American material, it's really good. We love it to bits here in Great Britain. Um, right. Now, this list has only the light anti-tank guns of the 25 Pinder, the Staghound, and the Stewart. You might find that you need a little bit more anti-tank, and for that, a peer team is perfect. Now, if you're not going to run your flamer in the Jeep, the peer team is actually quite good in the Jeep. So I'm buying a regular peer. Um, it is too expensive for what it does, and it is a pretty crappy weapon. If, it, if you've ever seen a peer in real life, you'll notice that it's, it's a spring-fired weapon. So basically, you put a grenade down the tube, and at the end of that tube, there's a spring. And then when you pull the trigger, the spring pushes the grenade out. Um, they were famous for being inaccurate and for being <laughs> short-ranged and bad, basically. Um, but in the game, well, what do you know? It's more or less a panzer fast, right? So we're buying one of those. And we have ooh, a few points left over. Let's buy extra men for our dudes here. So we're buying one extra man for our lieutenant, just because you can put SMGs on them. They become useful, right? And, and it's for free. It's very good. Um, and we can also buy one extra man for our free observer. Again, depicted as on models. So I always give mine some machine guns. I made mine from a, a sitting Perry uh, Desert Rat, um, gave him an, a, a cab, an officer's cab, and I made a, uh, a little um, binoculars and then gave him an, a submachine gun. And that is my observer. He's been that for, for years now. Really good. And, and he often gets a free extra man, often with a radio, because that makes sense, right? So he needs someone to call back home and tell the artillery where to land. All right. We have 10 points left over. What do we want to spend those on? Ah, uh, well, let's buy one extra man for one of the infantry units. Infantry is always good, right? 999 points, perfect. Now, the final thing that we do is we look at special rules. Uh, there's a lot different here. So you can see national characteristics, Commonwealth nationals, more Commonwealth, so there's a Commonwealth for Italy, Commonwealth for Italy, and Commonwealth for Italy. The only thing that you need to worry about is the one called national characteristics. That is the basic one. That's the one that, that's for British, basically. So you can see here, we can get up and at him, blood curling charge, toughest boots. All of that is, the, these are the ones that uh, the Maoris had, right? So toughest boots here. Um, Roll special uh, extra dice in close combat for every three men in the close combat. Roll an extra die. So, so that's good. Um, but I think we can do even better because now our Maori troops that are our push unit, these units can fight in close combat. Um, though you will notice that they're not such tough fighters. They just get an extra die. Um, but I think there are some 
of these that are even more usable. So if we look at rapid fire and vengeance, we have a lot of <clears throat> rapid fire one, right? We have a lot of veteran, uh, sorry, regular riflemen in this army. So rapid fire would give us extra dice shooting as well. I think that can be really, really strong. And I think that's the one we're going to go with. But we could also do vengeance. Vengeance with every, every uh, one of your units that has an enemy within 12. Um, before you give an order test, you roll a die. On a full plus, you remove one pin. So that actually removes pin markers if you're close to the enemy. Uh, also really, really good. And I often use that because that also affects tanks. As it is, I think with this amount of riflemen in our army, I think we can go with rapid fire. Now, the beautiful thing here is rapid fire will also affect the Maori unit. So the Maori unit will roll extra dice when they're shooting and they roll extra dice when they're in close combat. Um, I don't think that the Maoris are, uh, they're not the best close combat units that we can make. Definitely not. So you shouldn't push them up into close combat uh, against something that's equal or better than themselves. So veterans or large groups of regulars. But you can go up and close combat smaller units than that. Um, so smaller units of regulars, um, units of inexperienced dudes, you can close combat that. For the rest, they are the, they're just there to threaten enemies away. So enemies will dislike charging units that have close combat special rules. And now since they have the fire special rules, well, they become even better. So they are a unit that you can push up into the center table and have go down on an objective. That is the list. That is what I would recommend for a beginner. Um, going, starting out, making desert bricks. And will you notice it's 14 order dice? So right where we want to be, the lieutenant with an extra man, SMGs for those guys. Nine man regular section, eight man regular section, eight man regular section, 10 man Maori section, a free observer with an extra dude. Um, two eight man sections here, rapid fire for our special rule, which means that we have a lot of infantry that gets to shoot, right? So much infantry that gets to shoot extra dice. Each of these units get at least two extra dice, right? And the Maori one gets three because they have more than nine men. And I kind of like that these units have um, extra dudes because that will mean that even when you start taking casualties, you'll still get that, those two extra shots with the unit. Really good. The medium mortar, just so good, so efficient. Uh, the flamethrower in a jeep or the peer in a jeep that can really mess up enemy in infantry uh, and tanks or just enemy tanks, depending on what you put in the um, the jeep. Um, the one small team that you're not putting in the jeep, you should use a center table and just threaten away um, with the flamethrower, threaten away everything, basically. Make sure that they don't come too near you. So there's sort of an area denial weapon, a flamethrower, just placed behind some line of sight blocking cover. A peer team can do the same with tanks. Um, area denial. The light artillery, so useful, and uh, you should place it so that it can look out and shut down uh, firing lanes through the table so that you'll know where the enemy uh, um, tanks sort of move because they, they're not going to want to, to drive in front of an AT shell. The stack hound, oh, so good. We love it. And the darker steward, so very, very competitive and good. <laughs> and notice it's only 130 points. Hmm. <laughs> it's really good. Right. That was my list for Desert Brits. That's what I would do if I was starting out again. Um, a lot of infantry, um, a lot of it that's really good skirmish infantry, so you can sort of move a little bit out. Um, it's not, it's not 
assault infantry as such. It's not um, a flamethrower heavy infantry. So it's it's infantry where you can learn the game and you can feel like you're winning games, you're winning duels with this infantry as well. There are no units in this army that are redundant and unhelpful. Um, the closest thing that we get to that is the um, is the Piet, which is not a very good um, anti-tank weapon, but it, it's there, it's, it can do the job, and you sort of learn how to play with it. And you also learn how the flamethrowers work and the forward observer works. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said for learning how British works in, in this list, and you get to play around with many of the national special rules as well. So, good luck to anyone starting out, and buy those parries. You'll regret it if you don't. Right. Cheers.